Hey. From Miss Megan. And as she begins to speak, we're going to take up an offering. Yay! I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> Thank you. So we're going to do that, and you're free to speak. Okay? Go ahead. I'm really excited to be here and have the chance to talk to you guys. It's quite an honor. And I always felt like it was a funny thing when people would say, you know, people would have an opportunity like this and they would say, well, this is very humbling. And I thought, well, that seems silly because it's kind of an honor. It's kind of the opposite of humbling in a way. But now that I have the opportunity, I realize how it's humbling because I'm going to get up here and tell you things that I'm not always the greatest at. <laughs> So it's kind of humbling because now you all are going to you're going to hear my words and maybe you'll see me not being so fantastic at what I'm telling you sometimes. <laughs> I don't know what to do with my pen. Okay. I wanted to talk with you guys this morning about communication and specifically about hearing. Hearing God and hearing people. Um, communication more than just words. Your communication is, um, it's, it kind of encompasses everything about you. It, it, it includes your body language. Um, it includes your verbal responses and your nonverbal responses. Um, so it's more than just your words. But I want to propose to you that communication bestows value. Not just that it names value, but it bestows value. So, um, I loved that song that the worship team just did. You didn't have to come, but you did. Um, and I think this is talking about how God's presence communicates to us. You know, you didn't have to come, but you did. And when you came, it changed the whole room. You stepped into my past filled my world with grace. You didn't have to come, but you wanted to. And um, that that wanting to is key, I think, because, you know, when someone comes with, say you, you need to go somewhere and you want someone to come with you, you might have someone that comes along with you reluctantly and you feel it. You know, you know they don't really want to be there. But Jesus came and he wanted to be there with us. And how many of you know how that makes you feel when you know someone wants to be there with you. It makes all the difference. It, it tells you you're valued, and it's very important. So we are valuable because God says we are valuable. Um, his word creates. And so when he says, you are valuable to me, you really are. It's not just that you're valuable in his eyes. You actually are valuable. Because I want to talk about hearing. Um, I want to say to you that hearing is foundational for communication. If you're not hearing, you're not effectively communicating. I was looking up Bible verses to kind of help me along as I was writing down my thoughts and what I wanted to share with you guys. And I kept coming back to Proverbs. There's so many little things in Proverbs about communication and listening. And Proverbs 18, 13 says, If one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. Um, Proverbs 18, 2 says, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. So speaking well comes from a place of having understood already. And then there's the old saying, that they won't care what you know until they know that you care. And it's so true. My mom used to tell me that all the time. <laughs> um, and we love because he first loved us. And I would say to you that we listen because he first listened to us. He bestowed our value. And so we can bestow value to others the same way that he did to us by listening to them. Um, so we'll talk more about hearing him in a little bit. 
but for now I want to kind of talk to you about person-to-person -person communication. And this may um, only take like 15 minutes to get through, I really don't know. I've never spoken for this long in front of people before, so we'll see. Maybe we'll have some free time afterward. <laughs> um, so our heart is involved in hearing. Good listening turns your heart toward the one to which you're listening. You can be so frustrated with someone, but if you stop and take the time to listen to them, your heart connects with their heart, and you begin to understand what they're experiencing, and your heart is changed. Um, I am a nurse, and I have um, worked as a hospice nurse, and I've had so many patients who and family members of patients, probably even more than patients, who um, the staff is just getting really frustrated over their interactions with these patients because they need to do something, and they have only so much time to do it in. And, you know, when you're a nurse working as an inpatient nurse, time is always uh, something you don't have enough of. And so I've had so many patients who um, staff is getting so frustrated because they need to do something for this person and the person won't let them do it or the family won't let them do it and they just don't have enough time. And I can't tell you how many times when I would stop to listen to that patient or to that family member and to hear their story and to understand where they're coming from, they, instead of turning into this source of frustration, before my eyes this person would transform into just a precious individual that that um, deserved my time and my attention. And this happened because I stopped to listen to them. And you couldn't view them the same anymore after that point. You can't just, um, you can't just pay attention to your own self and your own frustrations at that point. Your heart's connected with that person, and their well-being is important to you. Um... Before you can affect any positive change on another person, your heart has to be connected with their heart. Otherwise, you're going to just be frustrated. It's going to be difficult to affect any change. Um, and that change, though you may be able to cause it to happen, it's going to be damaging to their heart. I think about this with my own children. Um, you know, I'm got to get somewhere, got to get something done, only have so much time to do it in, and they're not cooperating. <laughs> and I'm getting frustrated, and they're getting frustrated. But when I stop to connect with their heart, I realize that it's not just what's important to me that matters. What's important to them matters, too, and meeting them where they are matters, too. And I can begin to affect change that brings their heart along with me instead of pushing them away and just, you know, forcing them to comply. This is the, um, this is the thing that I struggle the most with, probably. So you guys will have to keep me accountable now. <laughs> when you connect with a person's heart, you can perceive what they need in that interaction. And oftentimes they're not telling you what they really need. They're telling you how they feel, or you're seeing how they feel, but they may not know how to communicate what they really need. But if you've connected with their heart, the Holy Spirit, the Bible says he will teach you in everything that you need to know, and he shows you what that person needs in that interaction to meet that need. And then the relationship can progress, and you, you, know, you can make progress. You can accomplish things once you're able to meet that person's need. And this is valuable all these things are valuable in all kinds of relationships. Children, coworkers, clients, things like that. They're, it's valuable in every relationship. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. There's no pat answer that's going to meet everybody's needs and you know, solve all the problems. You have to know how to answer each person where they are. And then people want to know that you see them, that you see them, that you know who they are, and that you see into their heart, that you see
feed those needs that they have that they don't know how to communicate. So for seeing them, are you looking at them distractedly? Are you really paying attention to them? I know that this is um, so important to my daughter, Grace, that when I'm, when she's trying to talk to me, she's like, Mom, you're not paying attention to me. <laughs> Am I actually looking at you? Am I paying attention to what you're trying to say? Is my attention divided, or is it yours in that moment? Do you know who they are? Are you blowing them off? Are you acknowledging who they really are and their value? Um, someone used to tell me when I was growing up that respect was only for the parents, not for the children. And that used to frustrate me so much because I thought, I'm a human being too, and I should be, I should give respect, yes, but I should also be respected. And I think that that's so important in our communication that we show respect. And are we seeing into their hearts? Are we naming or helping them to name the motive behind their behavior? You know, you can, when you connect with someone and you're interacting with them, you can, um, you can see what they need and you can name that thing. And when you name that thing that they've been frustrated over, but they don't know how to express, it's like a weight is lifted off of them. They're like, yes, that is it. And yes, you understand me. You're, you're listening. I'm important to you. Um. I, in my work as a hospice nurse, again, I had this one particular patient. Um, she was, I worked in an inpatient hospice unit, so oftentimes the patients that would come to us, they were dying. Um, these were their last days. And this woman was, she was in bad shape. Um, she, she had cancer, abdominal cancer, and she was in so much pain. She had a, a stomach tube down her nose, an NG tube, um, because her intestines had stopped moving. So everything wanted to come back up. So for her comfort, she had this, this tube down her nose. She had huge wounds on her belly. She couldn't move because she was in so much pain. But she wouldn't accept any medications for her pain. Um, and the staff was getting so frustrated because we needed to do things for this woman, and she wouldn't let us, or her husband wouldn't let us. And, and people were getting frustrated, and, you know, the feelings were just uh, just negative towards, towards them. And so it came time for it to be my turn to take care of this woman. And I decided to stop and to take time for her. And so I sat down next to her bed, and her husband was there sitting in the room with us, and I talked to her, and I listened to their story of how they had come to this place in their journey, and, you know, it had been sudden, and, you know, she was well, and they were on a vacation, and all of a sudden, they were told she had cancer, and, you know, she was dying very quickly, and she'd been in the hospital, she'd had all kinds of procedures, and, um, she wouldn't take the pain medication. It turned out because she had taken a pain medication in the hospital and it had given her horrible, scary hallucinations. And so she was too afraid to take anything. So as I sat by, the, by her bedside and I held her hand and I listened to their story, I let my heart break with them and I even cried with them. I understood what was happening from their perspective, and I was able to name it. I was able to say, I hear you saying this. I hear that you're afraid because of this, that you want something for your pain, but you're afraid that this will happen again. Um, I was able to explain all of the options that they had because there were other things that she was able to take that weren't going to do this, but they didn't know that. They were just so afraid, and people were pushing them to do things that they didn't want to do. Um, and I left the control in their hands. You know, I said, I'm not going to do anything to you that you don't want me to do. I'm not going to give you any medicine that you don't want me to give to you. And so I, at that point, it was like a, a relief for them, a breath of fresh air. Oh, you're not going to force us into something that we don't want to do. Um, and because...
because I was able to do that, because I took the time to do that, the husband was able to grieve. Instead of just fighting to protect her, he was able to really sit there and cry and, and be honest about where he was in the situation instead of just having to fight, fight, fight. Um, she was able to accept the treatment that ultimately brought her comfort and took away her pain. And I wanted to say something about else about the grieving that the husband was able to do. Pastor Bob said a couple weeks ago, um, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't write fast enough to write it all down exactly as he said, uh, but if you can let yourself grieve something out until you get to the place where you meet God and you're grieving, then you're going to be okay. And that's so important. So important. So anyway, in that whole interaction, not only because I took the time, was I able to help them, I was also changed. A piece of my heart belonged to them. And I'm sure you can tell as I'm get tearing up as I'm telling the story. Um, it piece of my heart grew in love for them and and not just for them but people in similar situations my compassion grew and also um, my confidence grew because I started to realize I, I can understand people you know this was a really difficult situation but I'm able to understand a little bit about what's going on with them so that I can help them So not every story is such a success. Um, you know, every day we, ha we can have these interactions. Not all of them are going to be such a success. But we, don't, we also don't always see the ways that what we do affects other people. If you have a really tough person who has built wall after wall because of heartbreak after heartbreak, it's going to take encounter after encounter of this type where through the actions of other people, Father God tells them, I see you. I know what's happening to you. My heart is breaking for you. And I want to help you. And, you know, you might not be the person that gets to see them break free and begin to trust, but you don't know how what you're doing is affecting them. You know, each one of those interactions is imperative, and they build on each other. And God is so patient with us. He doesn't tire of sitting with us and listening to us pour out our hurts and our anguish, even our anger. He's not taken aback by it. He can handle it. He's not shocked or surprised, either at our anger or our desires. So I want to talk with you also about how I learned to hear God and how I learned that he is a really good listener and how he taught me how to listen. So my story is that I grew up in church. I was a good little Christian girl. I wanted good things. I gave my parents trouble, but not anything terrible. I was strong-willed. Um, and as I was growing up, I all I really wanted was to be the wife of some great Christian man pastor, missionary, worship leader, something like that. So toward that desire, I got married very young, and I quickly realized that I had not got myself into what I thought I had got myself into. Instead, um, I found out there were a lot of lies going on, broken promises, there was substance abuse. Um, and suddenly, out of all those lies, I found myself single, divorced, I had a baby, and my dreams of being that woman, that, you know, the wife of that upstanding, godly man were gone, they were shattered. And I struggled so much with that. Um, I wondered who would give me a chance at that point. What was my life going to look like? You know, this nothing. It, my life didn't look anything like I had imagined. How was I going to raise my child? How was I going to stand the loneliness that I was experiencing? And so I started to express those feelings, and it started out verbally. I 
was venting lots of pain from my loss, anguish, sorrow. Um, you know, every night I would just cry into my pillow. It, I read Psalm 6, 6, and it says, I'm weary with my moaning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. I drench my couch with my weeping, and that was me every night <laughs> for a while. And that kind of got repetitive. I got tired of the same old, same old. So I started writing in a journal so I could have a marker that I could then move on from. Um, and I did that for quite a while, just expressed myself in my journal. And then uh, a while down the road, a couple years later, I began reading this book called Listening Prayer. It's by Seth Barnes. And he does the World Race, if you guys are familiar with that. He kind of founded that organization. Um, and this book, like the title says, um, teaches you to pray and to listen to God. Not just to express yourself, but to hear him. And I thought at first, this is kind of crazy. <laughs> this is weird. This is a little presumptuous. Uh, but I started to try it anyway because I... I was reading blogs of these people who were related to this organization, and they seemed like they had these really good relationships with God, like they really did hear him, and, um, you know, he was doing amazing things with their lives. So I tried it, and I felt completely ridiculous at first. Um, and I didn't trust myself to be hearing God. So I started in my journal asking God questions, but I would only do yes or no questions, or um, things that I could explicitly verify with the Bible. You know, I would only trust myself to hear things that were, like, already in the Bible. Um, I had grown up being taught, Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? You can't trust yourself. <laughs> Don't follow your heart. Um, and so I was so afraid that I would deceive myself. Um, I didn't know what the Bible later says in that I will give them an undivided heart, and I will put a new spirit in them. I will remove from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. I didn't learn this till much later. <laughs> uh, but over time, as I was journaling and talking with God and asking him questions and beginning to trust myself to hear his voice, I needed more communication than just yes or no, you know, something that was already in the Bible that I could already read in the Bible. Um, I began to try pouring out my heart and then listening for a response to that. And sometimes what I would hear was surprising. It wasn't what I would have expected. Um, it went back to that listening to what a person needs, to hear what they need that maybe they're not saying. And his responses to me would be addressing those things that I, I needed but I wasn't saying. I'd gush a long paragraph and Usually his reply was one or two words. Um, but when I heard those words, they were what I needed. It would be like um, one of those surface tension experiments from science <laughs> where you keep piling stuff on and piling stuff on, and all of a sudden you put the last item on or you put a drop of dish detergent in to break the surface tension and everything just plunges down. Um, you know, I, I would be frustrated and expressing myself and pouring out my heart and piling things on. And all of a sudden, he would answer me, and it would be such a simple answer, but it would just break the tension, and, and I would cry, um, but like good tears, cleansing tears, and it was what I needed to hear. And it would be like a flood of relief when that happened. And it would be what I needed to be able to go to sleep and make it through the next day. And make it the next day, and we would repeat the process all over again. In that time, I was alone. I was very alone. I was lonely. But that time with my father became a very rich, deep, beautiful exchange where a, a real relationship was forming, where I could communicate with him, and I could hear his responses and trust him. Um, I was learning to trust him and myself a little bit. <laughs> I didn't trust myself completely. I was beginning to receive healing from him instead of just hoping for everything to magically be made whole again. And I think that that's so important because 
that's a big obstacle to healing for people. They want, they feel that they can't be healed unless everything is magically made perfect again. But they can. They can receive healing from God or God. And I began to really learn what his voice sounded like. So remember the original point that communication bestows value. So all of this took place over a period of several years. It wasn't a quick process. It was very slow. And God was so patient with me. He never lost patience when I was lamenting the same things over and over to him. He didn't get frustrated and say, well, haven't we moved on from this yet? He just, he never pushed an agenda with me. He just met me where I was. I remember that he would um, frequently, continuously affirm who I was, remind me of who he was to me, and that he was with me over and over and over. Simple, basic things like that, but I needed those things in order to be okay. He told me the things that I needed to hear. Wherever I was, that was where he met me, over and over. Communication bestows value. If you have someone who's looking up to you in any way, and if you're alive, you probably do, your words bestow value on those they speak about. And not just your words, but your actions, your body language, everything about the way you communicate, and the way you listen, bestows value, whether it be positive value or negative value. Do you really see that person? Do you really see what's going on with them? Look past the immediacy of their behavior, what's happening right in front of you. I think I made that word up, but I couldn't think of the right one for that, for what I was trying to say. Um, what's behind their behavior? What do they need to know? What do they need to hear? That time in my life was a time when I had been stripped of everything that to me gave me value. And I needed to receive that value from outside sources because everything I thought made me valuable was gone. Every word of affirmation that I received from someone that I respected was a treasure to me. I wrote them down, I pondered them, I treasured them. I asked God about them. Were these things true? Were they reliable? Was this person reliable? Could I trust what they were saying about me? And while he was gentle, patient, and kind, he also showed me, I guess, a, reform of res a form of respect or honor in that he spoke to me on the level I belonged on, not the level I thought I was on. He was very gentle, but he would, I would ask him a question, and he would sometimes say to me, you know, you know the answer. You know, I didn't trust myself to know the answer, but he did. He would tell me things when I was, I was always trying to get him to direct me to do things. What should I do here? Where should I go? Where should I live? What should I do? And he wouldn't just tell me. He would tell me, you're free to choose. And I would get so frustrated with that because I just wanted him to tell me what to do. But, but he trusted me. He respected me and honored me enough to trust me in those things. And that was amazing to me. And I, yeah, I didn't feel I could be trusted. I didn't feel I knew. I didn't feel I could be trusted to choose, but he trusted me. He bestowed value on me when I felt I had lost my value. So I, I had previously needed to verify everything I was hearing with the Bible. If it wasn't in the Bible, I couldn't trust that God was telling it to me. I could only trust what I, what, what I heard if it was expressly written in the Bible. As I began to hear his voice through those around me, and through my own interactions with him, I learned his heart toward me. And my communication with him got richer. It became more of a conversation than a brief, short dialogue. Because I began to know his heart. So I knew the things that he was telling me were true. It wasn't just that I was making them up in my head. But I knew his heart toward me. So hearing his voice is simple. It's not complex. It's, it's not hard. But we're complex. 
our inhibitions, fears, preconceived ideas, sometimes our theology muddy those waters for us and make it hard for us to hear him. But hearing him isn't hard. It's just as complicated. He's listening to you, and he is speaking what you need to hear. And you can hear him. Anybody can. It's as simple as hearing your own daddy talking to you. You might not be paying attention because all this is going on over here, but your dad's still talking to you. Sometimes it's as easy to get rid of those barriers as determining um, it's worth just feeling silly and going for it. Sometimes our inhibitions are the only thing that's keeping us from hearing him. Uh, Sometimes there's an obstacle that we have to work through or that we have to get his help in identifying so that we can get around it. If you feel that you're struggling to hear him, you might need to talk to a trusted friend who can help you who knows you, who can see into your heart and see what you need. Um, I read a lot of books on inner healing and hearing God. I was really hungry for that in my younger years, and those things really helped me get through those barriers. Um, Sozo ministry is fantastic. Um, It helps you to identify those barriers and get rid of them because they're all based on lies. The whole structure of Sozo ministry is is you asking God questions and them helping you to hear the answers. And you realize through it, oh, I do hear God. It's not that hard. It's not that complicated. So for those of you who don't feel like they hear God speaking to them normally, um, try it. Just try it. Make yourself a little bit more vulnerable than usual. Test the waters. Ask them yes or no questions, things you can verify in the Bible. <laughs> that's that's what it was for me that got it started. And he's not, uh, don't feel like if you don't hear him speaking paragraphs to you that you failed. You know, everybody starts somewhere. And it's, um, he doesn't think you're a failure because you don't hear everything he's saying to you. It's like when you have a small child and they're learning to speak or they're, they're learning to understand you or they're learning to walk, you're not frustrated with them. You don't think they're stupid because they don't get it all right away. You, you think they're adorable for trying, and you praise them and encourage them, and that's how Father God is. So let your inhibitions go a little bit. You can try journaling. Journaling is important for me because, like I said, it's like setting up something to remember by. Hey, I was going through this. And this is what I shared with God, and this is what he told me. So I can kind of use that as a stepping stone so I don't have to rehash that. You know, if I'm going through the same thing, I can look back and I can say, oh, this is what he said to me. I forgot. I can move on from this. If you're going to try journaling, start by just being honest with yourself about what's going on in your life, if that's something that you struggle with, just being real with yourself. And then work on being honest with God real with him and then ask him his response and give yourself time to hear that response don't explain it away to yourself don't say oh this is just me I just made that up in my head I thought it was the right thing to say so I wrote it down (laughs) don't explain it away and for those of you who do hear God regularly that's awesome and I know there are so many people in here that do so many people in here that hear him even better than I do (laughs) Um, if you do hear God regularly, then ask him to let you see those around you in his eyes. Ask him to help you to hear him for them. And slow down long enough to do it, because if you don't, you're going to miss it. Really see them and hear them. Look at them. See who they are. See what they need, what they're maybe not telling you. They're probably not telling you. 